So just in terms of the format tonight, um, what we're going to do is we're going to have um, the, each candidate's going to have a few minutes to just uh, give their pitch, so tell us a little bit about what they're about, um, what their candidacy about, and what we can expect um, if they do get elected for the decision they're running for. We've got um, two ECAN candidates tonight and then three city councillors uh, who have uh, come along. Um, and then after we've had the pitches, as I should say, um, we are going to have a round robin style of questions just in terms of some uh, proposed EV uh, policies that could uh, help drive EV uptake. And then we'll go to questions from the audience. We've probably got about 10 minutes for questions. Um, so that's pretty much the thing. If you do think of anything you want to ask, please save it until the end, and then we can sort of do that in the question time. And uh, depending on how much beer we buy them with, the candidates may stick around afterwards. <laughs> Uh, for uh, further sort of discussion. Don't yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. Um, so I'm just going to go in order of speaking. Cool. All right. Oh, so yeah, yeah, you yeah. just did this. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Um, coming up. So, Hey everybody, um, I'm Dion Swift, uh, current city councillor for Christchurch Central uh, and am hoping to um, grovel enough to get the vote again to, um, to do my work again for another three years as the councillor for Christchurch Central. Um, I'm, a, I'm an EV convert, um, I'm probably not going to go and pitch myself around why I think EVs are great because I, I imagine we're in a converted audience here. Um, but I thought I'd let you know a little bit about the story about why I um, decided to buy myself an EV for my birthday present um, in 2016 and went from a V10 BMW M5 to a electric car, which in itself was a massive shock. I tell you, I miss the noise, I don't miss the fuel bill. Um, so I, went, I, I bought an EV because my background where I was brought up, uh, we had quite a poor family um, and we were, we were brought up around sustainability and actually looking at your own and understanding what you take you need to give back and so I remember as a child we had four boys in the, in the family and every day we had this little garden and we needed to take and then we needed to make our food and then we had to replant and we had to replant what we took and it really taught us the, you know, what, what sustainability was all about and so I grew up, went to the Navy um, for a few years, ended up as a warfare officer, um, driving ships around the world, which was really cool. I came back to New Zealand, started a business, and then, you know, what you do in a business when, you've, when you're sort of making a lot of money, and you go, hey, look, I, I want a nice flash car. And it wasn't until about 2015 that I realized, hmm, what I've actually gone off the path of where I was actually brought up and how I was brought up around the sustainability stuff. And my mum's a true hippie, like absolutely true hippie. She lives on the west coast on a farm that I bought, and we're completely off the grid. The, the, the farm is certified organic. Uh, we grow um, we grow our own vegetables and give a whole lot of vegetables and, and stuff like that, and we dry uh, stock off so that we can have organic stuff. Um, and so it really is, is part of who I am, and what I'd like to see happen in Christchurch moving forward is that we, we start to, to look at what we are as a people, and how we give back to what we take. And I think this is really important to the residential red zone is going to be a really massive opportunity for this and I'm really keen to get stuck into that. The residential red zone we took a lot of people, I took, a, took away a lot from a lot of people. But as a city it can actually give back. And I really want to see the opportunity around sort of carbon sinking that area, what it can do for food production, localization, localism and all of those kind of things. We need to be as a city also looking at how we do localism because Two of the biggest trans uh, two of the biggest emissions from car uh, sorry carbon emitters are the port and the airport, and what drives a lot of the port and the airport fuel I mean the emissions that come in is the fuel, and it's the behaviours that we have as a people that drive all of those um, those those behaviours. Um, you know, sorry, I'll start again. It drives all of the you know the spending. You've got AliExpress, you get stuff that needs to be shipped over, and all of those kind of things. So we need to be thinking about how we do things more locally. And as a city council, I think we have an opportunity to start. Uh, looking at our, our economy and, and incentivising in small ways to actually get local producers here, th keeping things local so that we all start to, to buy local, be local and, and really start to, um, to think about our, our, our imprint on, on the world. So yeah, I mean, EVs are great. Uh, they're only one part of the, trend, the solution. Uh, you know, we have an EV, we've still got to think about the, the, you know, the impact that that has in another part of the world. Uh, we, need to be, uh, we need to continue the investment into the active transport. Public transport is really, really important and I'm really quite keen on the, uh, the new hydrogen cell ship, uh, sorry, car um, bus that's up in Auckland. I think that's a really cool technology that's 
got really good application for heavy vehicles, and those in Navy are starting to look at some hydrogen fueled ships that might be um, in the next fleet that come to New Zealand, which would be really, really cool because there's you know, heaps of water where you're on, on the, when you're on the ocean. Uh, but I'll, I'll probably leave it there. I mean, ask me some questions later about specific stuff that you want, want to know, but I'm really keen to continue the work that I'm doing in the city. Um, especially around the central city and, and I really do want to get into that residential red zone because I do think from a sustainability point of view it can put Christchurch on the map. Cool. Thank you. 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 Kia ora My name is Mike Davis, I'm the councillor for the Papua Nui Ward. Uh, just a quick background on myself um, around EV cars. Uh, when I got elected I sort of came through the community board and we did a lot of work on, on cycleways um, and sort of, I sort of drove home how important cycleways were. Um, at the same time, um, I sort of wanted to change my lifestyle a bit. So when I got elected, elected to council, we sold both our petrol cars. Um, I pretty much got a commuting bike and we bought a, an EV. I'd actually been trying to pressure my wife for quite a, a while to buy an EV. I keep showing her the numbers, it works, it works. And, um, and so eventually I, I succeeded there and we got an EV and it's a, it was a fantastic move. And I, I think one of the, the disappointing things I hear a lot is the fact that they're not affordable. Um, you know, we were spending $100 a week on the, on the family car and petrol. Um, and and just get, we got our EVs 2016, did 5,000 Ks, so it was less than $20,000, 20, you know, the, the higher purchase on that and the charge was less than what we were paying on on petrol. Um, so as soon as we pay that off, you know, it's just made so much sense. So it's a shame that there's a lot of these conversations going on, a lot of this media, um, about the fact that you can't, we can't afford to buy them because they're too expensive. Well, they're the brand new ones. There's actually a lot of affordable EVs, and I think that's the story that we need to be telling, especially in an urban environment like Christchurch. Um, and now you can actually get anywhere, and it's, I think it's actually quite good to be able to actually drive, have a break, and then go to the next part of the journey. Um, so yeah, when I got elected, they were the two things we did, um, and we haven't looked back. It's a, it's a fantastic car, and I think it's really, really important for the, the future of our city. Um, two of the main things, you know, I, I focus, I guess, uh, as a councillor on transport and the environment. So, you know, both um, cycling and EVs, they go hand in hand, we do know my um, like Dion said, transport is our biggest emitter, over 53%. Um, and as a council, we're about to set a uh, target to become carbon neutral, net carbon neutral on Thursday. Um, and so we need to actually start working out how, as a city, we can move towards the, the target. Um, and although, you know, trying to get pe more people cycling and, and more people onto public transport is going to be a, a key part of that, we've got to realise there are going to be a huge amount of people that just can't do that and are still going to rely on vehicles. And, and the solution on that part is the electric vehicle and trying to get more and more people on board. Um, obviously, I think the central government is going to play a huge role in, in that and trying to obviously incentivise the uptake of electric vehicles and obviously at the same time I guess discourage the um, the uptake of petrol cars like we can see right now you know the number one car um, is the Ranger um, so something needs to happen we need to actually change what is currently happening in New Zealand because um, you know we may be a small country but we're actually not doing a great job in terms of reducing our emissions um, so if I, if I get re-elected I think we one thing I'm going to focus on is just trying to focus on our, our sustainable transport network, um, modal choice, how we can actually make electric vehicles more attractive to use. Um, obviously as a council we're a little bit limited on what we can do there, but it's just working out the whole network and what we can do. But yeah, I look forward to some questions later too. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, Axel's running for ECAN as opposed to City Council, so I'll just mention that so you don't have to. But uh, no, I'll, like. no, I'll actually exp explain that. Excellent. But we are all friends here. I, I just wanted to uh, <laughs> point that on. We, we actually we all <laughs> get on really well with one another. Yeah. So good evening. None of us running against each other. None of us running against each other. Yeah. It's kind of handy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> even, even beyond that, um, I think they're all uh, really, really good people. 
So they're all Vulcan, uh, that's for sure. Endorsed so, by Axel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if, it, if it matters. So I'm just tweeting it now. <laughs> 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 I go for it. So, Kiara Koto, uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, it's, it's great uh, to see that you're taking an interest in local democracy. It's great that you're taking an interest in reducing greenhouse gases. Some of you might uh, be most, most interested in saving money, but even that's quite okay. Um, so my name's Axel Wilke, as Will has pointed out, and I'm standing for ECAN, and I'm standing in the Christchurch Central or Hauko constituency. And so the ECAN constituencies, they are made up of city wards, and my city wards are Fendleton, Rickerton, the central one, and Linwood. So if you live somewhere through there, okay. And uh, I have a background in traffic engineering and transport planning, and that is the primary area of expertise that I would like to bring to Ekan. In fact, uh, I'm uh, partnered up with uh, Lauren Farr. She is already on Ekan, um, and the two of so you have two votes per Ekan board, uh, and the two of us we are the only candidates who actually bring subject matter expertise to the council. Uh, she's a freshwater ecologist. I'm the uh, the transport person got my uh, two degrees from Canterbury and, uh, and it's important uh, to finally get somebody with this expertise on the council because almost half of Ekan's budget goes on transport and they are doing a pretty piss poor job the camera, please record that, <laughs> piss poor job with it. You know, the central city has uh, got back going again. We are at 39,000 jobs, pre earthquake about 50,000. For the last five years, um, the number of passengers counted on a per population basis has been falling. That is outrageous. It's totally going in the wrong direction. So that's why I want to go in there and uh, sort this out. Uh, I could talk to you about the Northern Arterial. I've been in the uh, media about this um, um, earlier this year uh, quite a bit. Um, but I won't go uh, too deeply into it. It's just one of the things where the last central government has uh, forced something upon us that in terms of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions is, is uh, going to put us in exactly the wrong uh, direction. So there's better things that we could do and uh, my council colleagues here, um, they are trying hard but the New Zealand Transport Agency isn't playing ball and weekend isn't helpful either. So, so my idea is uh, there is a joint transport uh, um, committee and I would like to be on that and then try and sort this out uh, from the inside. So um, uh, my values are uh, quite simple. People and planet's well-being of a private profit, absolutely essential. Honesty, transparency and integrity. Um, decision making has to be evidence-based and we need to aim for intergenerational justice and environmental stewardship. If you wanted me to sum up what my values are in one sentence, I would want to make decisions the way our children and grandchildren would want me to make those decisions. Um, the reason I'm standing, uh, it's uh, absolutely number one, the climate and ecological emergency that we are facing. We really need to get onto our greenhouse gas emissions uh, rather swiftly. Uh, the IPCC tells us what it is that we have to do, how fast when you work this out, uh, by how much we have to reduce our emissions. The numbers are frighteningly high uh, since 2010, which the IPCC uses as the base year from where they say 45% reduction in emissions based on 2010. Our mileage driven in Christchurch has increased by 15% since uh, 2010. So it's gone in exactly the wrong direction. To turn this round is going to be a really, really uh, steep challenge. And I really uh, look forward to being able, hopefully, to work with these good people here um, to, uh, because it, uh, public transport is not something that he can, can sort out by itself. You really need the city council on board. Thank you, colleagues. Yeah, 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 Whether public transport is reliable or not is mostly a function of what the city does in terms of bus priority measures. So, it's probably... Uh, That's great. It's probably enough.
Thank you. Westmoreland and then kind of back up through the middle of Wigram and uh, Sockburn, kind of upper Rickerton area, back into Avonhead and what have you, uh, Bishopdale and Casebrook. So it's a phenomenal area, a small area of only about 100,000 people. So if you live there, I probably haven't door knocked you, so <laughs> don't leave the light on tonight. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a massive, massive area and it would be a privilege to serve. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, where do I start? I'm currently a community board member for the Herewood Ward and I absolutely love the community board. Um, I'll acknowledge Simon Britton. Put your hand up, Simon. Sure. Simon is a candidate uh, running for the Papanui Ward. Luke Chandler is running a return for uh, community board and council. And council. Boom. Blair Anderson, here we are, running for mayoralty. Uh, Blair was at the uh, housing forum this afternoon and he spoke very, very well, as he always does. I'm not missing anyone. Put up your hand. Anyone, any other candidate? That's good. So, and the incumbent councillors, I have the deepest respect for, and without a doubt, Axel and his passion and his dedication and his expertise, these four people, I, can, I can't recommend enough. If you are in there, 
if, 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 if they can represent you as a, as a resident on the council or you can put a ticket beside your name. It's simple as that. I, I, I have no hesitation in that recommendation. A little bit more about myself. So I said, uh, community board member. I've been self-employed, so I'm a company director of you know, doing a lot of stuff. Um, I do volunteer business mentoring with Business Mentors New Zealand for about the past five years. Have a, I've had a hospitality background. I lived overseas for about nine years in Tokyo and in London. Uh, I actually owned my first motor vehicle when I came back uh, when I was 34 years old, so I'm pretty used to having an efficient transport, uh, public transportation system. Uh, beyond that, uh, I've got a leaflet over there. Just read it. Um, <laughs> when it comes to ECAN, uh, I've got three main kind of policy areas. One is water. Anybody like water here? Raise your hand. There's three aspects to that. Uh, one is chlorination. I won't go into too much detail, but I genuinely believe that the Christchurch City Council will endeavour with there is so much effort going into improving infrastructure so that we do not have to disinfect our water, that it will be removed. That, it's as simple as that. No one wants it in there. It's as simple as that. And the sooner we can get it out. Unfortunately, there's some people that live in this place with Wellington who keep on changing the rules. The same people who changed the rules in 2010 and kicked out the current, or at the time, the Environment Canterbury Council now. It's called the government. The second aspect of water is water bottling. So I've taken a pretty strong position regarding water bottling in Belfast, uh, particularly regarding the community supply and potential uh, competition long term. So in 20 or 30 years time with the expansion of population in the northern areas of Christchurch, uh, the extraction of water, production of plastics, you know, the list goes on. You know, the, the greenhouse gas emissions by transporting, transporting water in these little wee plastic bottles overseas. You know, there's, there's a few issues there. But the big issue long term is, obviously, for me, is nitrates in water. And particularly in the WIMAC area, there's this thing called Plan Change 7, blah, 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 blah. Really important stuff. The long and the short of that is I don't want to make a public statement in case, you know, later on I come across as having a kind of a, um, you know, predetermined you know, opinion on something. So for me, governance is one of the most important things that I think that the next fully democratically elected ECAN Council can uphold. So along with Axel and La, I know that we all share the same idea of having a little bit of an independent review of everything that ECAN does. I'll just test the room here. Who has a confident, positive opinion of Environment Canterbury and everything they do? Raise your hand. How about even 80%? Are you, are you happy with 80% of what ECAN does, what you see on social media? 50%. 50%? That's cool. Yeah. Generally, raise your hand if you think ECAN's just kind of flowing in, in a lot of areas and you're just kind of shaking your head. I'm with you. you know, I'm disillusioned by a lot of things. They are doing good work in some areas, but there needs to be a hell of a lot more better work done and it needs to be communicated as well. You know, um, that's the long and the short of it. I won't go any uh, further past that. The second aspect of my platform, so water, uh, is buses, so public transportation, uh, an affordable, accessible, zero emission public transportation system is, I guess, the, the goal and the aim. However, I do support the idea of transferring that responsibility to the Christchurch City Council. It does require legislative change. For me, it just kind of removes a level of bureaucracy out of ECAN. Maybe it will save us some money. Um, I realise that some jobs may transfer from ECAN across the, you know, across the town to uh, the City Council. But the City Council pay for all the infrastructure, the bus stops and you know, different bits and pieces. But ECAN decide all the routes and it's just a bit of a headache for everything. So having an integrated transportation system with WINAC Council, Salwood, and multi it's already been explained here, is it just makes sense that the three local councils have a better say about what's happening there. The third aspect of uh, my policy is climate change. So mitigation and adaptation, particularly around uh, vulnerable communities, coastal communities, sea level rise, the changes when it comes to you know, climate change and food production, 
uh, protecting vom uh, versatile soils for food production locally. Again, it's been, um, been alluded to here already. There's, there's a lot of stuff happening. Uh, and then there's also things around resilient communities, civil defense uh, responses as a region. You know, if the Alpine Fault goes, that's going to be a big headache for a lot of people, you know. Um, so, yeah, so I'll leave it at that, I think. Um, oh, EV stuff. Uh, <laughs> we're here for EVs. That's 20 minutes? Um, 30 seconds. Uh, recent convert. Got the Kona outside, sorry. Um, I needed something with range. I do about 20,000 Ks uh, with my business each year. I needed something that you know, I can jump in and go. Q&A, you'll find out pretty darn quick. I'm not a techie. I like stuff. I can, I'm the kind of person that you want consuming tech like this. You want I rock on up, high purchase, or throw over the cash, or give the bank manager's details. They call in, please. You know, give me a loan. You, you, you want you, you want you, <laughs> you want general public like me getting into these things. It's as simple as that. I've also got a wee e-scooter. I brought that just after Christmas. I checked the, the kilometres that I've done since Christmas, just under 500 k's. Most of that's been during the campaign. It's been fantastic. But again, uh, Sarah already talked about the number of Ford Rangers around town. Out delivering leaflets. I'm surprised how many big ass vehicles there are around. And that scares me. You know, how long they'll be around on our roads in New Zealand. Get up the door. A sustainable future, there's never been one where everyone has their own car. It's a jigsaw with lots of different pieces making up the complete picture. From a well-designed uh, pathways for walking and cycling, to effective and convenient public transport, um, to car share schemes, uh, filling in those edges uh, where people just need to get from A to B. Um, where I see myself trying to campaign for and help uh, you know, everyone uh, get these issues out there is, um, you know, I see EVs as filling in those gaps where maybe we're still waiting for that excellent public transport infrastructure to come online. Uh, and, you know, if anyone knows, you know, if you're trying to transport a whole bag of rice from, you know, the supermarket to your house, you want to do it in a bag, not per gram. It's basically public transport for our roads. Um, I think it really, I think it's really interesting that most people don't think of flying as public transport. Uh, but you know you don't get to see uh, you don't get to choose who you sit next to and you uh, don't get to choose when it goes. So it's just about having high quality public transport. Um, there are some major barriers to EV adoption: lack of accurate information, a step change in the way we've always used petrol vehicles as personal transport, and people actively spreading the wrong information have a massive impact on the willingness of someone to consider EVs. The, mass, the other massive barrier is the higher cost of entry. However, this barrier is mainly linked to lack of information. For many of us, a car is the second most expensive purchase, uh, purchase we'll ever make. And it's really hard to experiment with that second largest purchase when it's something you don't have a lot of information about. It's because of these reasons that electric vehicles need support. The International Council of Clean Transport found that uh, having electric vehicle policy that supports both at the time of purchase and also as the life of the electric vehicle um, contributes to those purchase decisions and contributes more to getting rid of uh, CO2 emissions. Um, we recognise that it's hard for councils to fund time of purchase incentives, but that doesn't mean that's all you can do. So I've been looking at that Achieve Policy Toolkit from Plug in America to look at some of the successful policies and we want to know what you're thinking of them. Um, so, let's get some policy questions. Before I get started to that, there's still four seats over there if people want to, you know. I mean, I feel lazy and I love sitting down, so please don't send a mic out. Yeah, or shuffle forward or do anything you like. There we go. Seats are for sitting on. So, advocating for the electrification of public fleets is an effective way to put the importance of prioritising clean transport into the public spotlight. EVs save taxpayer money and it's good for public health. And electricity, cheaper than gasoline, 
uh, can mean much lower running costs and total costs in the vehicle over the lifespan. Um, would you and your roles as lo lo local council or uh, ECAM representatives uh, be in favour of setting a time frame to transition to a fully EV fleet? Uh, just raise your hand if you're in favour. No, no, I was going to ask. Oh, yeah, okay, cool. Why don't we go down? You guys can say something. So we'll start with Aaron. A time frame to fully electrified. Fully electrified. Yeah. I'd support it, but yeah. I just see barriers. Cool. There are barriers that would stop it. Sarah? I completely support it, but in, and unfortunately it's not local government's role. So in America, the, the local council is something to have much... Um, oh, sorry, I don't yeah, mean yeah. fleets in total, I just mean council fleet or oh. the EGAN fleet. Oh, oh well, we've done it. Yeah. We've, we've, yeah. And we've directed oh. our CCOs already to, to move that way. Cool. Um, so we've, I mean, the council was one of the, the founding... Um, the so there's already a time limit yeah. in place for Tractor City Council to convert all vehicles? We've sold 50, how many of our small vehicles, the little Yaris's that we used to have, yeah. and almost all journeys of the <coughs> council staff now uh, through Yugo Share. Yep. Yeah. Um, so and for the, the vans and trucks, is it going to be a matter of when those come, become available? Yeah, so, so the, the, that's the CCOs yeah. that have those rather than four oh, council staff. Ranges, yeah. Park, park rangers have utes and stuff like that, but park rangers are now using e-bikes as well, which is really cool, but they're, yeah. um, they're very efficient. So I think it's when the technology catches up yeah. that we actually need to start like, right. like doing so, these things. But, but yeah, absolutely, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Yeah. The other thing that we have done though is because because we have CCOs so and we've got Red Bus and normal normal companies have to act under the Companies Act um, to increase, to um, give the best profit to shareholders. But because we are the shareholder of Red Bus, we've been able to say to Red Bus, actually, we understand that it doesn't make financial sense for you as a company, but we want you to buy electric buses. <coughs> and so we've been able to start that process and price. There's only three currently, but that's a process that's only been able to start because the council owned the fleet. Yep, yep. Um, they still have to put you know, DCAN and do contracts. Just on that, there's a lot of rhetoric going on in this election campaign about selling assets and all of those kind of things. And there's a lot of rhetoric around five assets that the city owned in terms of companies not making any money. Well, I'll tell you why the, one of the companies isn't making money, because we're making an invested in electric buses. Yeah. And so, I mean, when, when a city owns the asset, we can actually direct those companies to actually do good things for the city. It's not just about the monetary return yeah. that you yeah. get. So, it's great having assets. Yes, I think we need to be thinking about how we leverage those assets a bit better, but these are the kind of good positive outcomes that you get. So just don't buy into some of the bullshit rhetoric that you're hearing around that. Sort of uh, I'd like to offer two aspects. Uh, firstly, I sat down with Paul McNow, who's the uh, CEO of Red Bus, uh, the other months, and uh, had a long discussion about EV buses. And he reckons uh, in three to four years' time, uh, that's when the battery prices will have dropped sufficiently for it to make financial sense without any incentive, without the city council saying, uh, go for it. So that's one thing. But I'd like to offer a higher level answer as well. Um, being a transport planner, the uh, deputy, uh, the, the second in charge, uh, the minister of transport, uh, Julian Gator, is an old colleague of mine, and I was quite disappointed. Um, but I also can understand why this came about uh, when uh, she announced government's uh, policy of uh, 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 getting, uh, um, you know, putting a stop to the country being able to import um, uh, gas gas, uh, so to speak. And I, I would really like to see us as a country taking a step and saying, right, uh, we are using pricing mechanisms much more aggressively um, to bring the change to electrify the fleet forward much more quickly because that is what central government can do and in my opinion that is what central government should do. Um, but it's, it's way too timid, you know, there are countries around, uh, they have uh, um, targets, you know, no more uh, um, Gas gas was being imported by 2025, you know, and that's what we should be doing as well. Set, set a target um, and ramp up import prices and, and uh, start subsidizing the EVs, and we will see a very, very quick turnover of, of the fleet. Pricing mechanisms is where we need to go. Um, 
My, yeah, I'll quickly, quickly touch on that. Yeah. I think we're all committed to try and get to an electric fleet, especially we've got the ability to control some of that through the companies. Um, like I said, we're going to be setting a target very shortly, which we believe is ambitious. And obviously, for us to achieve that for a city, we need to actually make sure we can, the things we can control, we do it right. And so, yeah. if we've got the ability, therefore, to make sure they go for electric fleet, we'll make sure that happens. In terms of the buses, I think the, the quicker we get there, um, to become electric, the better. Um, but I think the government needs to step in there first. I think they are one, the other ones that need to supply the buses to us um, instead of actually having the companies do it. Because I think I can see one company willing to do it and another one that's a little bit hesitant. So I think the government need to actually start supplying the buses to all the authorities that are electric and go for a different type of model. All right, um, something else. Bit different and um, probably a bit more council focused. Um, owners of gas guzzling vehicles have many options when it comes to gas stations at which to fuel. Um, but for people who drive electric cars, fueling happens differently, whether it's at home, at work, or on the go. Uh, EVs have many unique needs and challenges to face our communities when it comes to charging these cars. New constructions need to be EV ready with pre laid wiring for charging and of electric vehicles we needed. Uh, so in terms of measures that can increase uh, that support, um, just put up, up, I guess we'll say, put up a hand if you're in favour of um, requirements for body corporates and shared dwellings to allow EV charging installation where possible at the request of the tenant. Um, yeah. And, yeah, if you yeah. want to make a comment on that. Yes. I, it's just one of those making sure that that's something we're allowed to put that in. Is yeah, but in yeah. favour you, yeah. in, in general, general in, in favour of possible. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, again, yeah. I'd like to have a little bit a higher level view of things. Uh, um, parking policy or the lack thereof is something that really, really distorts what happens in transport. Um, that's one of the factors that has really driven us into becoming such a car dependent society. You know, in Canterbury, we own 913 vehicles per 1,000 population. Believe it or not, 913. It's about 100 vehicles higher than the United States. I mean, how crazy is that? So, um, and one of the things that that we should be doing in the, uh, the government, uh, the national policy statement that is coming out, is uh, we need to take uh, parking out of the district plan requirements. You know, if you build such, you must provide that many car parks. You know. Uh, let the market decide what, what people want. And one of the things that councils, that city councils can respond to this situation by, you know, body corporates not having um, um, charging stations or body corporates not even having car parks, think uh, Williams for, 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 for a second, is to actually have charging stations in the public realm, you know. Why not um, put charging stations throughout the city um, and let people uh, uh, charge them there. So, to me, that is the way to do it, rather than forcing um, property developers to put it onto uh, private land. Sure. So, two quick things. Firstly, is that um, one of the good things that happened with our district plan was that exactly that happened for, for the central city. So, the government did um, take out the parking requirements um, for new builds in the, in the CBD. Uh, so that the market decides on that one. It has ended up as a transition, putting additional pressure on the parking that we do already have, and that's caused some consternation, but big picture long term, um, it will do the city a world of good. Uh, and the other one, you want to put on the second one, what's that? Public realm. Public realm. Oh yeah, so um, we own Orion, or well, we own 90% of Orion. And Ryan has been doing a lot of that. How many units have we seen? Yeah, yeah, we're still trying to get some in Lindwood. Um, but yeah, so the council owns Ryan, and Ryan has been doing public realm um, charging. Yeah, look, well, as, as a EV car owner, I, I very rarely charge outside of my own home, and so I do see the importance of that we buy it and build it a house and that now to actually have that technology available in terms of the public. Ones. I think one of the biggest frustrations is having to buy a whole new cable to be able to charge on them unless I want to have a tethered cable. Um, I, I think when we look at some of the developments that are happening in the city centre, I won't go into the price of them, um, but the actual, if you look at the east frame, you've got choices of actually having an apartment with no car park, 
um, or an apartment for an extra cost of about sixty thousand dollars to have a car park. And from my understanding, those car parks are future proof to be able to take um, EVs. So that's that's where that we need to go. Um, uh, the question of whether you want a step change to go straight to nothing, um, or you want to transition and say, actually, these are the houses with no car parks. Here's a few car parks to try and take that gradual transition to the to the right direction. All right. Um, Axel mentioned something which will bring me to the next one. Um, in Wellington, they are currently running a trial where they've installed a whole bunch of curbside charges for residents to use in places where they do not have off street car parking. And the, such in Christchurch, we have Littleton, where a lot of people have been speaking to me about their lack of off street car parking. Uh, just maybe show of hands in the comments um, would you be in favour of uh, installation or consideration of curbside charging infrastructure? And any comments? Absolutely. Good. Good. Okay. Yeah. I'll pick up on something there. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, regional, regional travel and tourism. Things like uh, electric uh, motorhomes or the, the camper vans and the, uh, the, the, the space shuttle or whatever the, uh, type of things. <coughs> and the uh, is there a lack? Well. It's a silly rhetorical question. Is there a lack of capacity, you know, stations that are available in the remoter areas? You know, obviously, we're going to have a bunch load here in the CBD. We can do more in, in Christchurch. That's relatively easy. You know, every supermarket's going to have, you know, a few here and there, or you can go down the road to somewhere else and there'll be something there. You know, companies can invest in that and they'll see the benefit of doing that. But when it comes to going, you know, a little bit further afield and going from A to B, as soon as there's three or four vehicles there, if there's a fifth come along, you know, there's, there's going to be a bit of a wait and that type of thing. So the capacity of charging in rural areas or more ro remote areas, um, so when you're traveling longer distances, I see that as more of an issue. So being able to incentivize that aspect of it, I see as being, you know, something that should carry equal if not a little bit more weight? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that, but I think as technology changes, the distance is cars can go way further. Um, so therefore, as the numbers grow, probably the weight is not going to be needed because we'll be able to get to a destination. Yeah. Like at the moment, I've just got the 24 North battery, so it's a really an urban car. And if I did want to drive to Kaipora, I think I'd have to probably stop an ambulance and shit here. Kaipora, <laughs> but that's, that's my choice. To do it, if I don't want to do that, I could just rent a rent a car if I really wanted to. But um, but I've never had an issue. I've done a couple of long journeys. I've never had an issue when I've got to a charger. Um, and I think when there's more EVs, I don't see it's going to be an issue because I think people will keep up buying cars that have long distance. And the main the main barrier um, with curbside charging is that if you don't have access to off-street car parking and home charging, you can't really buy in there. It just doesn't work. Um, of costs in terms of storage, whereas with long distance charging, you know, maybe you can wait for the traveling, maybe that's a sort of holiday journey anyway. Uh, whereas you don't even have that option to go or not go long distance traveling if you can't charge your car at home. So that's where that's quite important. Um, we've got our last uh, question for you. So, um, to address the barriers to EV adoption, consumer education can have a powerful impact on supporting consumers to make the right choices. Nothing gets people more excited and bought into the idea of an EV than having ride and drive events. Uh, these opportunities give people a chance to kick the tires and check out EVs for themselves and so they can see how easy it is. Uh, would you support an allowance for EV education uh, and helping transition our vehicle fleet? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. I, that's, um, it was one of those events when I joined Hugo that led to me um, selling my car. Right. And, and doing you go, and um, it's really interesting having done that and knowing how important that is. To see if we can focus them in different ways as well. I noticed the um, distinct lack of women in the room, um, and I don't know factually for sure if that is an issue, but the car stuff generally seems to be loads. But I think there's a real opportunity with EVs because you know, the whole. I mean, while well, you know, cars these days are so, people don't tinker on them so much and stuff. You know, EVs are so easy, right? And in theory, you'd think that 
whatever societal expectations and things around that should have dissipated. But I don't know if they have or not. So I don't know whether women are taking them up at the same rate as men. I just don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll just add to that. Um, I don't know the rate, but I know when we first bought our EV, I think once you try an EV, you actually love EVs um, very quickly. Um, but I did notice, when, especially at the start, you know, when I first bought it, everyone on the EV would wave at each other as I go, but we're all just happy. Um, <laughs> 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 Not so much now, I think there's more and more people owning EVs, so it's not as much, but at the start, like, it wasn't as many, so everyone was smiling and waving. Um, but actually, I didn't see much difference in the gender. There was actually, yeah, yeah. I think, a lot more women I've noticed, but you may know what the... I don't think one of the reasons for the, for the makeup of the room is just in terms of the, the amount of people that joined this group initially uh, who were doing the part of the um, And then, you know, it's the people that sort of, uh, sort of dedicated, is a polite way of saying it, to uh, show up on a, on, a, on a school night and sort of talk about religious movements. But yeah, um, okay. we're always welcoming everyone. I understand. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the, the presence of the the enthusiasts at the Twin Rivers Car Parade. Uh, <laughs> I've been out there a couple of years, so run by Rotary, that's correct, isn't it? So I think it's fantastic to have all the gas castles out there, but then you've got the kind of the arena ring uh, with the Tesla and the, and the Leaf and the, uh, the, the Nissan, the, the little van that was there this year, that kind of thing. So having yes. that ability there. But then you just mentioned car conversion. So I've got a 69 Fed Bambina, right? <laughs> Help me. <laughs> Help me convert that little bambina to electric. Love you for it. And so the environment. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, last bonus question, guys. Um, maybe just in order, is there anything that you see that, you know, if elected, um, you could uh, help push the message or help push the um, cause for either personal EV adoption or for business adoption or just um, ways in which you can help the city uh, transition faster. Uh, do you want to start? Take us off. Put you on the spot? Yeah. It's, 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 yeah. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big question um, that I'll try and nibble at. The, I think it's just the role of people in a governance position to advocate for things that make sense for the benefit of society long term. You know, whether it's water or transportation and things like this. So, yeah, EVs have an important role in the future of New Zealand and particularly in Christchurch and Canterbury and in our region. So, we should be advocating for that. So, whatever form that takes, I'm not an expert on it, but I'm very happy to listen and, you know, I'm a pretty quick learner. So, yeah, and it's a matter of getting, at the same time, folks around the table as well folks around the table help when you're trying to pass things um, because sometimes yeah things things don't pass even if they're good or what I think is good. So I'll leave it at that and I'll yeah. talk to you. I much. have no doubt that the Christchurch City Council is going to um, help um, push the EV message. Um, we've got our uh, citywide net neutral target to be decided next week. Um, this week? This week. Tomorrow. It's tomorrow. It's tomorrow. tomorrow. Um, and a strategy, climate change strategy coming up, um, and, and work has started on that. To get the city to net neutral is an enormous task because the council, the council do not control everything that everyone does in their everyday lives. And so a, a concerted education campaign and all the things that go with that um, will be part of what council does. The goal is going to be to get to 50% reduction by 2030. And that's going to take some big shifts as a city. Yeah, I think the city is probably going to do more than ECAN ever will. Uh, you know, ECAN is pretty cash spread. Um, and, you know, it's the, the buses, it's really the city that can make that happen. Uh, but Procurement. But the, 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 yeah, the, the thing is, where's the money going to come from? Because it's going to be more expensive so it, it really I can re realistically you know I mean I could tell you um, we'll just make this happen um, but realistically um, because public transport has been run so to the uh, into the ground um, 
they're struggling. They're really, really struggling to even keep things going um, the, the way they are. And so uh, to come up and say, oh, we are going to convert uh, quickly at a time when it financially doesn't quite make sense, I don't want to make that, um, um, that statement because it's not realistic. The city can make this happen, and I will support the city as much as possible, but with certain ECAN budgets, I can't, I can't see it happening in the next You can get a bigger years. budget. Yeah. You can get a bigger budget. Yeah. And it's more rates. If we build, and, and the... Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I know, but the thing is, like, you've been asking us to do the infrastructure stuff and make sure that we're getting the infrastructure built. And we have exactly the same issue. The NZTA are coming to the party with the funding, and you're expecting us to increase rates to do it. Yeah, the, the, the thing is, you know, again, bigger, bigger picture. We currently spend in the National Air Transport Program, which is, you know, the uh, fair, where the uh, spending gets, gets divvied up. We spend five times, at the current NLTP, we spend five times as much on roads than we spend on public transport. In Auckland, they spend twice as much on public transport then they spend on roads, you know. How we as a as a region make those spending decisions, that has got a lot more to do with the um, environmental outcomes um, that we get. And it is at that level we really have to um, turn things around and, and the electrification of the few buses that run around um, that have really poor usage. The average Christchurch person um, makes two bus trips a month, two. I mean, whether they be on diesel or electric, in the big scheme of things, it really doesn't make much difference, you know? It is, it is whether people um, have opportunities to change, um, whether we stop building big roads. That's the big thing that's going to make a difference. I mean, I that's what I stand for. I think that even if you get to say that you know, a bus that's running on diesel is better than 20 cars running on diesel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mike, do you want to... Um, look, just quickly on the public transport, I think it's fair to say, you know, this, this partnership between ECAN and, and Christchurch City Council, and it's not working that great at the moment for various <laughs> reasons. But look, public transport has been under for decades, um, and we're so far behind that, well, it's not funny. And, and both ECAN and City Council need to seriously look at what we're doing. Um, I personally think that ECAN should be looking after the regional the Greater Christchurch route, those mass transit lines, and I personally think it should be rail, um, probably light rail, yep. preferably, but it, on the heavy rail tracks then coming into the CBD. And I think the city should be looking after the supporting bus network that the people of Christchurch use, because um, it shouldn't be up to a regional council to look after that. Um, but we need to see how we can get that transition to electric uh, buses as quickly as possible and probably electric trains. But um, in terms of cars, it's trying to work out what, as, as a council, we can do. And, and it's, I guess it's about how bold we want to be, uh, especially as we move forward to, to some of these um, tough targets. And these conversations we're going to have. But like, I guess a, a good question to, to the audience, um, and it's saying we're, I guess, debating that hasn't really been talked about much, is, HOV lanes, should they be, should EVs be allowed in HOV lanes even if there's just uh, one owner, one driver in it? You know, does that incentivise people to buy a, an EV when they're living outside of Christchurch if they can drive in an HOV lane? Um, so, so, HOV lane, i.e. bus lanes? Yeah, yeah bus lanes. So, we're so looking at doing bus lanes, well, NZTA are doing an HOV lane on the um, Wamakari Bridge coming into on the north on the north motorway and we're having a conversation now for the for Cranford Street about an HOV lane. Um, so the question is if there was an HOV slash EV lane, which I don't know if it gets through my colleagues, would that incentivise an uptake in EVs? Um, you know, and it's a good question for people here, because you, you know, would that incentivise people to buy an EV? If you know you get a priority down a Do we do an audience poll, hands up if you're if you find an incentive or hands down and be in favor of the Everybody And I'll be the the spoil sport. I thought you would I thought you would be Yeah. Sorry, you for the Oh do it. Sorry.
That's all right. I understand. It's, it's, it's elders first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. We love them. Anyway, um, I think there's. I think uh, for me, it's it's what's realistic, and there's there's three things, and um, well, there's three things. One is infrastructure. Uh, so as a city, we can incentivize infrastructure for charging. Um, I mean, I cannot, I'm, I cannot count how many emails and messages and stuff like that we've sent to um, to Orion to try and get you know electric car charging infrastructure into every new car park that's done. And there is, um, we do control a district plan, and we can actually start looking at incentivizing you know, through district planning processes electric vehicle infrastructure. Um, but we can also do a step different and around development contributions and all of those kind of things. We can incentivize these things um, for developers to, to make these things happen. And I think that's one element that we can do. The other element, oh gosh, there was three things. Um, infrastructure, um, oh, education. Uh, so the reason that I got an EV was because I wasn't transferring my carbon footprint from a car to a coal burning petrol, uh, sorry, um, electricity uh, power station. We've got a lot of renewable energy that comes out of for the South Island. But what you would be quite shocked to know is that actually 228, I think, thousand tons of carbon is is emitted from Christchurch for electricity. So we're not completely um, in, in the in the green. You know? So we do need to be thinking about education, and, and that is around what is the sustainable practices, like um, you know how can we generate power in our home, and that comes down to district planning stuff. I think there's so much that we can do uh, to actually make make ourselves a lot better. And, and one other thing, T White Point is you know from the amount of electricity that I use in my car, you could you could if you close down that, and I know it's going to be a big impact on um, you know the economy down there. But I'm not saying so you should do it. But it would have 2.8 million electric vehicles per year. It is a massive amount of electricity, so I mean, do we need to invest in better electricity around the country that, that can stop our um, coal burning and, and um, fossil fuel burning um, power stations? Yes, and that's where it's local council and councillors, we can lobby, which is the third thing, which is lobbying. Um, so lobbying central government have a massive purse group. I mean, they take, just out of our rates, they take 15% of all of our rates, which equals about, would be about $90 million. I mean, we can start investing those in smart ways. Uh, we can start investing the NZTA transport money in smart ways. The city does not get a fair deal from this government. Um, and in any way, at the moment, we do need to be fighting for that. So I think over the next three years, we need to fight. But we all need to come together and sing from the same um, song sheet. We need to fight this thing. Um, and, and actually get proper infrastructure. Because uh, unless you've got the infrastructure, people are not going to, going to adopt. And it's not just the car alone. I mean, as I said, it's 228,000 tonnes of carbon that's been emitted for power generation just in our city when we thought we were, you know, we're about 97% um, you know, renewable, but that's still a huge amount. That, that, that would be about 10 million trees that have to cut just to offset that. That's uh, mostly sorry, ports one and hospital, right? What's that? That's mostly ports and hospitals. Ports, hospitals, uh, when the power grid doesn't cope, the generators turn off. And there's a whole lot of reasons. But anyway, those, those are the main things that I would be looking for from over the next few years and I really do think we can go a long way in the next few years. Axel, I'll give um, you one minute. Okay, number one thing for public transport, whether it's attractive to people or not, is reliability. Mm -hmm. What gives us reliability is bus priority. Uh, some bus priority relies on giving buses a head start where you know, the bus lane and the, and the vehicle lane go into one. Um, the moment you stick other vehicles like taxis or EVs into those bus lanes, those priority measures don't work any longer. Uh, not that we have too many examples of them in Christchurch. We should have many examples of them in Christchurch. That's why um, it's, it's a problematic thing to introduce EVs into some bus lanes, but then not others. How do people understand that, you know? So that's we why it's yeah. complex. We, we don't have any HRV lanes at the moment, but the question is, do we not have one corridor already that has no cars in it? The rail corridor? Yeah. Oh, we're getting to rail <laughs> in the next three years. All right, guys. Yeah, that's pretty much all we've got time for tonight. So uh, finish up at 8.30, um, have yourself refreshments. I'd just like to give a big thanks to all the candidates for coming on tonight. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming on.
we're going to put up a fight about two by five. Yeah.